2 Corinthians 7. So then, dear friends, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one, corrupted no one, taken advantage of no one. I don't say this to condemn you, since I have already said that you are in our hearts, to die together and to live together. I am very frank with you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement. I am overflowing with joy in all our afflictions. In fact, when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. Instead, we were troubled in every way, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the arrival of Titus. And not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort he received from you. He told us about your deep longing, your sorrow, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I grieved you with my letter, I don't regret it. And if I regretted it, since I saw the letter grieved you, yet only for a little while, I now rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. For consider how much diligence this very thing, this grieving as God wills, has produced in you. What a desire to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice. In every way, you showed yourselves to be pure in this matter. So, even though I wrote you, it was not because of the one who did wrong or because of the one who was wrong, but in order that your devotion to us might be made plain to you in the sight of God. For this reason, we have been comforted. In addition to our own comfort, we rejoiced even more over the joy Titus had, because his spirit was refreshed by all of you. For if I have made any boast to him about you, I have not been disappointed. But as I have spoken everything to you in truth, so our boasting to Titus has also turned out to be the truth. And his affection toward you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of all of you and how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that I have complete confidence in you. 2 Corinthians 8 We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I can testify that, according to their ability, and even beyond their ability, of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints, and not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us, by God's will. So, we urge Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this act of grace. I am not saying this as a command. Rather, by means of the diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving advice because it is profitable for you, who began last year not only to do something, but also to want to do it. Now also finish the task, so that just as there was an eager desire, there may also be a completion according to what you have. For if the eagerness is there, 
the gift is acceptable according to what the person has, not according to what he does not have. It is not that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality. At the present time, your surplus is available for their need so that their abundance may in turn meet your need, in order that there may be equality. As it is written, the person who had much did not have too much, and the person who had little did not have too little. Thanks be to God, who put the same concern for you into the heart of Titus. For he welcomed our appeal and, being very diligent, went out to you by his own choice. We have sent with him the brother who is praised among all the churches for his gospel ministry. And not only that, but he was also appointed by the churches to accompany us with this gracious gift that we are administering for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We are taking this precaution so that no one will criticize us about this large sum that we are administering. Indeed, we are giving careful thought to do what is right, not only before the Lord, but also before the people. We have also sent with them our brother. We have often tested him in many circumstances and found him to be diligent. And now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker for you. As for our brothers, they are the messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show them proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you. 2 Corinthians 9 Now, concerning the ministry to the saints, it is unnecessary for me to write to you. For I know your eagerness, and I boast about you to the Macedonians. Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you in this matter would not prove empty, and so that you would be ready, just as I said. Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, would be put to shame in that situation. Therefore, I considered it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance the generous gift you promised so that it will be ready as a gift and not as an exhortation. The point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, He distributed freely, He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. And as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. 2 Corinthians 10 now, I, Paul, myself, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble among you in person, but bold toward you when absent. I beg you that when I am present, I will not need to be bold with the confidence by which I plan to challenge certain people who think we are behaving according to the flesh. 
For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we are ready to punish any disobedience once your obedience is complete. Look at what is obvious. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, let him remind himself of this. Just as he belongs to Christ, so do we. For if I boast a little too much about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for tearing you down, I will not be put to shame. I don't want to seem as though I'm trying to terrify you with my letters. For it is said, His letters are weighty and powerful, but His physical presence is weak and His public speaking amounts to nothing. Let such a person consider this. What we are in our letters when we are absent, we will also be in our actions when we are present. For we don't dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. But in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves, they lack understanding. We, however, will not boast beyond measure but according to the measure of the area of ministry that God has assigned to us, which reaches even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves, as if we had not reached you, since we have come to you with the gospel of Christ. We are not boasting beyond measure about other people's labors. On the contrary, we have the hope that as your faith increases, our area of ministry will be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel to the regions beyond you without boasting about what has already been done in someone else's area of ministry. So, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one commending himself who is approved, but the one the Lord commends. 2 Corinthians 11 I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me. Yes, do put up with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we did not preach, or you receive a different spirit, which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. Now, I consider myself in no way inferior to those super apostles. Even if I am untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Indeed, we have in every way made that clear to you in everything. Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach the gospel of God to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by taking pay from them to minister to you. When I was present with you and in need, I did not burden anyone, since the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. I have kept myself and will keep myself from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I don't love you? God knows I do. But I will continue to do what I am doing in order to deny an opportunity to those who want to be regarded as our equals in what they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder... For Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will be according to their works. I repeat, let no one consider me a fool. But if you do, at least accept me as a fool so that I can boast a little. 
What I am saying in this matter of boasting, I don't speak as the Lord would, but as it were, foolishly. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will also boast. For you, being so wise, gladly put up with fools. In fact, you put up with it if someone enslaves you, if someone exploits you, if someone takes advantage of you, if someone is arrogant towards you, if someone slaps you in the face. I say this to our shame. We have been too weak for that. But in whatever anyone dares to boast, I am talking foolishly. I also dare. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one. With far more labors, far more imprisonments, far worse beatings, and many times near death. Five times I received the forty lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at the sea, and dangers among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. If boasting is necessary, I will boast about my weaknesses. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows I am not lying. In Damascus, a ruler under King Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to arrest me. So I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. 2 Corinthians 12 Boasting is necessary. It is not profitable. But I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a human being is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except of my weaknesses. For if I want to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I would be telling the truth. But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me, especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have been a fool. You forced it on me. You ought to have commended me, since I am not in any way inferior to those super apostles, even though I'm nothing. The signs of an apostle were performed with unfailing endurance among you, including signs and wonders and miracles. So in what way are you worse off than the other churches, except that I personally did not burden you. Forgive me for this wrong. Look, I am ready to come to you this third time. I will not burden you, since I am not seeking what is yours, but you. 
For children ought not save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for you. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Now, granted, I did not burden you, yet sly as I am, I took you in by deceit. Did I take advantage of you by any of those I sent you? I urged Titus to go, and I sent the brother with him. Titus didn't take advantage of you, did he? Didn't we walk in the same spirit and in the same footsteps? Have you been thinking all along that we were defending ourselves to you? No, in the sight of God, we are speaking in Christ. And everything, dear friends, is for building you up. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I will not find you to be what I want. And you may not find me to be what you want. Perhaps there will be a quarreling, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambitions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I fear that when I come, my God will again humiliate me in your presence. And I will grieve for many who sinned before and have not repented of the moral impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they practice. 2 Corinthians 13 This is the third time I am coming to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I gave a warning when I was present the second time, and now I give a warning while I am absent to those who sinned before and to all the rest. If I come again, I will not be lenient, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but he lives by the power of God. For we are also weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by God's power. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? And I hope you will recognize that we ourselves do not fail the test. But we pray to God that you do nothing wrong. Not that we may appear to pass the test, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear to fail. For we can't do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. We also pray that you become fully mature. This is why I'm writing these things while absent, so that when I am there, I may not have to deal harshly with you. In keeping with the authority the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Become mature. Be encouraged. Be of the same mind. Be at peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send you greetings. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. So, hello, welcome back. What is happening in this church in Corinth? Obviously, they are struggling. But what does Paul tell them? He's saying that this godly grief will bring about their repentance. He actually says, notice how willing you guys are to try and repent and do right. So he's saying, it's not horrible that you have been busted and you feel terrible. It's perfect. Imagine if they didn't care. Paul talks to these believers about how they should live. He stresses love. Christians are to take every single thought that crosses into our brains, he says, take them captive. Then we interrogate them. What are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? And if it's a legitimate thought, we let them through. But if it's not, we got to tie them up, put them in prison, kick them out. Paul speaks about Jesus, this gospel, this power, the, the hope that we have in the salvation that is offered. This is what we are to stick to. So when these cheats and these fakes and these liars, when they come around and they're preaching different things, Paul says, test them. He doesn't say, totally accept these guys because they know some things about the Bible. 
No, he says, you got to test these guys and be prepared to bust them. Earlier, Paul confesses to a struggle. Here he speaks of a thorn in his side. He admits that because of his own tendency to brag, God pops him. Some sort of a temptation or something ugly is in this guy. He doesn't want it. He says, Jesus, take this away from me. He does that three times. Jesus tells him, you don't need for this thing to be removed because whatever it does produce in you, my grace has got you covered. So what does this mean? Seems to exist in Paul specifically to remind him that he needs to be practicing these Christian values. Patience, humility, gentleness, all the cool and beautiful things he wrote to the church in Galatia. So he says, considering the way that this works, Paul is now happy to have this thorn in his side. Because when he crumbles, he can turn to God. God empowers him and he feels better. All of this is in response to a temptation. So what does it say about temptation then? This is a fascinating letter. He is writing this letter to a group of people who believe in Jesus. They are called the church. He writes to them that he is concerned that when he gets there, he's going to find them being filthy, envious, greedy, nonsense, crazy people. (laughs) I appreciate the candor. There is a difference from the letter written to the church in Thessalonica. All right, there are several other churches and messages Paul wrote for each of them. Thank you for watching. The NQE is out.